Well, good morning, everyone. Happy week four. This week, we're looking at work-life balance, and you will be reading Learning Leadership, chapters 10 through 13. You will also be reading The Trick to Balancing Leadership and Life, and you'll be watching an excellent TED Talk by Lars Sudman, Great Leadership Starts with Self-Leadership. And this is, I mean, of course, everything we learn in servant leadership is important, but these are major important topics as you are becoming a leader, a mover, a shaker in education at your site and possibly your district, um, county, state, nationally. Um, so let's start by just talking about the work-life balance. <clears throat> you have your interviewees um, this week. Some of you might have already started interviewing your people leaders that you admire. And I'm going to assume that you know these leaders and they've possibly mentored you and given you some of your tips as to um, how to be successful in your work-life balance. But I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. So when I first got into education, um, I was at school all of the time. You know, I'd stay late, I'd take all the commitments, I'd be there for the children, you know, 7, 8, 9 p.m. at night. Uh, at the detriment to my own children, my own family, because I felt that I needed to be of service. Um, you know, I was new to teaching and I wasn't monitoring my own well-being as much. I was just trying to be there for everyone all of the time. And, um, you know, and of course, what happens when you do things like that is you end up burned out. And we're still seeing, we're still seeing here in 2024, you know, going into 2025, um, an exodus of teachers due to burnout in education. And so you want to make sure that you are balancing your life with your work. Otherwise, what happens is when you're at work, you're worried about what's happening at home. And when you're at home, you're worried about what's happening at work. And you're not really anywhere because you're so you're so stressed about these things. And so some of the things that I learned is not to take on extra commitments when asked immediately. Now, I'm not talking about regular commitments like grading papers and parent conferences and those types of things. I'm talking about people would come to me often and say, hey, you're so wonderful at organizing or you're so you know wonderful at leading or you're so wonderful at this well that may be true maybe I was wonderful at those things you know I'm not going to discount you know something that might be a strength however um, I had to take ego out of the picture because maybe they just wanted somebody to fill the slot and they they came to me because I always said yes or maybe somebody else you know wanted to be out of that commitment and they came to me because they knew that I was going to say yes so something that one of my mentors taught me uh, is that wait 24 hours, wait 24 hours before taking on an extra commitment. Don't let that ego get in your way. Don't get all puffed up about somebody asking you to do something and then take on a commitment because you may want to people please or, you know, it makes you feel good in the moment, you know, that you've been asked those types of things. But go home, think about it, consider it. Um, talk to your family about it. See if it's something that really, you know, uh, feels right for for you and uh, your heart. Like you'll know if your stomach feels sick thinking about it. That you probably shouldn't do it. And wait 24 hours, and then just if you don't want to do it, write a very nice email saying, you know, thank you so much for the opportunity. You know, I appreciate you considering me. You know, at this time, I just don't have the bandwidth to be able to take something on with. Uh, my other commitments, but thank you for thinking of me with respect. Okay. And then it's done. If they ask you again, just repeat it. It doesn't mean that you can't take something on later on. Maybe you do want to do that, but it's just not fitting right now, especially with all of you doing your master's in education right now. That's, that's your extra commitment that you've taken on and bravo for you because that helps your, your, your work. And it also helps your home and it also helps your retirement usually. So um, I think that's wonderful. So waiting, you know, and the same thing when you have a, a, a triggering email. Uh, a lot of times in education, um, you know, people will send, uh, see me at the end of the day or they'll send something at the end of the day. So you're stewing on it all night before you um, talk to them in the morning. 
And uh, I always say the same with that. Wait 24 hours, you know, when it's possible to respond, especially when something's triggering. Um, and although it can be scary to go face to face, sometimes you need to go face to face to someone and say, you know, I couldn't quite read the tone of that email. Can you unpack that for me? Uh, and uh, just firmly, but kindly, but when you turn it back, um, they have to really think about how they presented something to you and if they presented it respectfully. So those are a couple things um, to consider. Uh, another thing that someone once told me is what somebody says in the heat of the moment says more about them than it does about you. And that you need to pay attention to the message under the message. Is this person feeling um, threatened by your power? Are they feeling passed over? Um, you know, uh, what's going on there? you know, and just take the time to really think about that before reacting. It's not always easy, um, but if you can take a step back and say something like, you know, I need to think about that for a second. I need to think about what you just said for a second. I'm going to get back to you. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the restroom. I'm going to get back to you. Make some space. Those types of things. Um, same with students. I mean, I'm not just talking about colleagues or admins. Same with students. Um, but with colleagues and admin, what people can do, and it's a toxic trait in education, we see it all the time, is they, they know that children are your calling and they'll say things like, well, you would do this if you, you, you really wanted to be there for the children. Being there for the children means that you need to take care of yourself. And uh, it, it doesn't mean you need to be selfish, but it needs, you need to be taking care of yourself. You need to find ways to self-regulate so that you don't burn out, so that you can be there for the children, so that you do enjoy teaching, um, that you can continue on for many, many years. And, you know, when you've been in the profession as long as I've been in the profession, you lose friends in the profession. And um, when I was young, so the turning point for me is I was young and I was staying very late at night. And like I said, uh, my children were with my mom. I wasn't spending as much time with them as I wanted to. I, I, I didn't feel like I was, I felt like I was, you know, <laughs> having a hard time everywhere <laughs> trying to please everyone. And there was a counselor and uh, I was very close to her and she was older than me. She was retiring and she retired and her plan was to sail around the world with her husband. They were avid sailors. She retired. She immediately got cancer. Um, she passed within the year, and when I was at her hospital bed, she said to me, I want you to live your life, and she said, because if something happens to you, there will be somebody in your classroom tomorrow, and it sounded really harsh <laughs> at the time because I was young, and I was like, oh, man, but as time went on, that's what I saw is I did lose friends where the next day they didn't show up for school and there was a substitute in their classroom. And so we have to find ways to take care of ourselves as we're servant leaders. Servant leaders, we tend to burn bright. And so to continue to burn bright, we have to find that work-life balance. So um, you have to figure out through self-reflection what works for you. Um, for me, I knew that I no longer wanted to take work home grading, that I did not want to, I, I did not want to continue my work day on the weekends or those types of things. And so I started looking at my schedule and figuring out what would work for grading for me. Um, going early on specific days and grading or staying late on specific days and grading and then leaving the work at the office. Um, making sure in my conference period that, um, you know, having my downtime with friends or professional development or, or those, but also when I was grading, making sure I was grading and that I was not distracted by other people. I had to really self-regulate um, to make it work for me. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, depending on your leader you have, uh, you're always going to struggle with that. And so, you know, uh, Lars asks you in his TED Talk, and I'm going to ask you too, and I've already asked you to consider a leader that you really disliked and consider a leader you really liked. And I will tell you that when, um, when my mother was ill and was dying, um, I had a leader that was um, not kind uh, and did not understand me being away 
and would dock me uh, pay for missing meetings and things like that. And everyone kept telling him, you know, she's the sole caretaker of her mother. You know, they live two blocks from the school. She checks on her during her conference period to make sure that, you know, she's okay. I mean, my mother was actively dying. And I had a person that was not in my corner, that had no empathy, no understanding, um, very much so micromanager. And even though I was a top employee in the district, writing curriculum for the entire district, um, teaching very well, keeping my extra commitments unless something happened, you know, where she was sick and I had to go or an ambulance was at my home, those types of things. He did not support me at all. And it made me not want to do anything for him. Uh, and then prior to that, I had a principal. Um, uh, I, I faced a great and tragic loss in my family where I lost my nephew. And our family was reeling from the experience. And um, this principal that I had before this principal was like, take whatever time you need. If you need to go home on break and check on your family, please check on your family. When my mom first originally got sick, he was very much so like, hey, if you need to go home on your conference period and check on her, if you need somebody to cover the class, if you need me to cover the class, I'm there for you. And he had my undying loyalty, my undying loyalty. And because I lived so close to the school, if somebody forgot to lock the gates or somebody forgot to turn off the lights, I had the master key. He would just text me or call me and I would happily go over there and close up, turn on the alarms, whatever, anything that he wanted because he was so kind and so compassionate and he knew what a hard worker I was and that I was just going through a really hard time in my life and trying to find that balance and trying to be a good daughter, but also trying to be a good educator and a good employee. So, you know, when I look at my leaders, you know, and I, I weigh those two people, you know, I think um, the compassion, the empathy, the emotional understanding that I had, and this was a principal who was very firm. Uh, you know, if, if, he was, if he was miffed with you, you were gonna know it. And, uh, and he was gonna say it, but then it was done. But then it was done. He was not a grudge holder. So all of those things I really like. You know, seeing, uh, respecting teachers as professionals, understanding that outside things come up and supporting them as they go through that, which helps you get back on track and be the best you possibly can be as an educator. So I really want you to think this week about who you've disliked as a leader, and this could be at anything outside of education, any job, and who you have really liked and why. And then as Lars says, I want you to also think about when you look at those leaders, what do you see in yourself of the leader you dislike and what do you see in yourself of the leader that you love? Because, you know, we all have those things. And so when you look at the one that dislike, you're like, wow, you know, am, am I doing those things? Do I need to work on that? And when you look at the one you love, am I doing those things? Am I showing compassion? And it really helps you to reflect and have some self-awareness, um, which brings me to uh, the next thing. I journal every day. And um, Lars talks about that. I journal every day. I write down um, just notes about my day. Uh, I have a gratitude list. I always put 10 things I'm grateful for. Uh, and you can always tell when I've had a good day, a good or bad day, when you look back at my gratitude list, because like on a bad day, it'll say like, I'm grateful for this piece of pizza. I'm grateful for being left alone. And then, you know, on a day where I truly am uh, sound and feeling grateful, it's like, I'm grateful for life. I'm grateful for my garden. I'm grateful for my students. And as you journal and you look back through these things, you can really see, you know, uh, when you're have, having a group of good days and a group of bad days and, and kind of, you know, self-reflect on that. Having said that, I also do a plus and minus column, you know, my strength for the day, a plus and my minus for the day, something I need to work on, one to grow on, as we say to the students. And, I'll, you know, usually I'll just write down like three or four things. But um, what happens is, is when you write things down like that, if you see 10 days in a row that you're struggling with something, 
then that lets you know right away that that's something you need to work on. And uh, so, you know, those things are really important as a leader. And you have to find ways to step back when you're governing people, when you're leading people. You have to look at why people are triggering you, um, how you're going to manage somebody that triggers you, how you're going to step back from ego, how you're going to have to step back from authoritarian if you're just bossing someone to just boss someone. Um, you know, are you really being understanding? Are you blanket, you know, like, oh, well, I can't do this for you because then I'd have to do it for everyone. Like you have to look at all of those things. Okay. So just some food for thought. I'm already getting at 15 minutes and you've probably turned the speed up on this till two or three and I sound ridiculous. So just know that I'm thinking about you and that this is a big topic and that's why this is a big video. And have a wonderful week four. I can't wait to see your interviewee work. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.